who may not know this young man behind me, this is Robert Crippen. Robert Crippen flew on the very first space shuttle mission, SDS-1, with moonwalker John Young. He would go on to fly three more missions? That's correct. Before he became director of the Kennedy Space Center for NASA. Welcome to Space City, Thank you very much. We're very pleased to have Bob on our show today. And Bob, what we start off with is basically, you've seen the width and breadth of show history. What do you, as you look out at the final orbiter on the pad, when we look back at the history books later on down the road, how will we talk about the shuttle program? What will its legacy be? Well, I'll bias. I've been, around, <laughs> I've been around the shuttle since its inception in 72. Um, played roles in several capacities, including flying the first flight with, with John Young, and uh, ended up, as you said, then center director here at the Kennedy Space Center, and then I went on to run a company that built some big solid rockets that uh, that the shuttle uses. Uh, I'm, no, I'm now retired, and when I look back, I'm uh, I'm proud of the shuttle. Right. Uh, you know, it had some high points, it's had some low points. We had two terrible tragedies, but NASA picked themselves up and recovered from those. And if you look at all the things that it's accomplished, it really has proven that uh, humans can do things far beyond what John and I thought back on STS-1. Uh, and we've revolutionized our knowledge of astronomy with the Hubble Space Telescope and other satellites we put up. We, um, we built the International Space Station, which is the nearing marvel of the world. And uh, so I believe history will judge the shuttle positive. You never know what history is going to do, but uh, I think I personally feel a great deal of pride at what the program has accomplished in 30 years. I'm hoping you'll share something with, with their fans that didn't get the opportunity to be at the 30th anniversary of the shuttle era. You said there's going to be, after the shuttle is retired, and it's, it's in, it's in the, the museums and such, a lot of people are going to be singing a certain country western song. Bob, what is that song going to be? Well, I said we ought to form a chorus with the three remaining orbiters, and uh, I'm a fan of country music, and uh, Brooks and Dunn have a great song that you're going to miss me when I'm gone, and I believe that's, gonna, I believe that's what's going to happen. Now, I can't help but notice you got the Belong Coalition for Space Exploration, a great organization. Now, you guys got a PSA that came out recently, and I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about that with us. Well, it tries to focus on some of what I call the spinoffs right. of, um, of the space shuttle program uh, because they're probably a little bit closer to uh, what some people uh, think of instead of space. Uh, everything from heart pumps to uh, uh, revolutionizing our knowledge of how to rescue people out of uh, vehicles after accidents uh, and, and those kinds of things, which I believe are important, but uh, I believe we're also meant to inspire. Uh, we need our our young people to be interested in science, technology, and engineering, and uh, I believe that the space shuttle program gives us some of that. And it doesn't have to be the shuttle, but as long as we're flying humans in space, exactly. I believe they will have that inspiration. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the Conrad Spirit of Innovation Awards. Right. Well, we were very fortunate in our last show. We had Shannon and Michaela Deesh on our show, and they basically invented a protein bar that went on there. Right. And it was really wonderful having them all through the coalition. They basically got to look all the teenagers in the eye and say, look, if you think space is boring, we just met Seth Green, you know, we're meeting astronauts and they're meeting movie stars, and oh, yeah, by the way, in five minutes, the shuttle's going to be shaking everything loose in the next 20 to uh, 20 mile radius, so it's not boring, you should be doing this, and that's a big part of what the coalition is in it. Uh, tries to get the message out. It, you know, it's made up of uh, industry people that are interested in space, but it's also made up of another group of individuals like myself that try to uh, keep people interested in it. I think we should take a second to address the uh, chat room. And uh, Shark, Sharky, I'm going to say uh, we'll, we'll try to get you a Bob Crippen autograph. We can't guarantee it. <laughs> and uh, Jeff, I agree with you. Crip is a god of you in space. Uh, thank you very much. I, I do want to point out something that's very important and pertinent to the current launch, and that is I have changed my shirt. And that uh, you haven't been here for this, He's but not uh, the red shirt anymore. Uh, <laughs> I wear the red shirt indicating we're in a no-co situation. Uh, we've changed into the black shirt. Uh, which indicates uh, we are actually go for weather at this point, and we are about one hour now. We are in Florida. Weather can change on a dime. I cannot stress that. It can go go. It can go no go. Uh, but for the first time since this count has basically started, if they've said, yes, at T0, we will be go. So that's that's our great good news. Absolutely. Now, Bob, i got I got I to touch on that, what, Bob, what he just said for a second. If everything works out in an hour, the last space 
ever is a launch. You were there for the first, and you flew three others. What do you? I mean, I know you got. You've had to been asked this question a bazillion times. What are you thinking right now? Well, I've uh, been busy uh, most of the morning uh, talking to individuals. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's primarily where I've been focused. Although, you know, I know what's going on, uh, and I've sat in, in the cockpit, I've sat in launch control centers in various capacities, and people are focused. I was really pleased that, in spite of the uh, unfavorable weather forecast, that they continued to count because I've seen it go both ways. I've seen us have 80% chance of going and, and not yep. go because of weather, and vice versa. So. Uh, they did the right thing. We'll have to see what it turns out to be in the end. Um, but uh, I think the crews are probably sitting out there relaxed, just hoping the clouds are going to clear. Well, even if they don't get the clouds to clear, I think if they light those solids off, they're not going to have to deal with clouds for very long. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But you want to make sure that we've got enough of a ceiling if we have to return to the uh, launch site for an abort. Also, the rain safety has got a ceiling requirement. Right. And we don't want any rain around, and no. you don't want any electrical activity around. So they need all of those area under control. I want to touch on the rain and the weather a little bit. Uh, a lot of people are confused. They're like, well, I don't, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, like, my plane can go through that. Why, can, why can't the shell, this technical marble, go through this? Because the amount of the... Well, I'm going to let you explain, Bob. Why should okay. I talk? Well, the thermal protection system, what we call our tiles, right. uh, are critical to the shuttle. Yes. Uh, they have to be on there. And early on, we uh, when we were carrying uh, shuttles around on the back of a 747, one time we accidentally flew through a rainstorm, and it obliterated the tile. Uh, the tiles are very, um, they're about like styrofoam. Okay. And if you're going several hundred miles an hour, and you have a raindrop, it eats it up. And, and when you say it obliterate, eats it, what do you, can you give it a description of what, we, what we're talking about here? Uh, like super glue on styrofoam? No, 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 no. It, uh, it just eats away at the styrofoam, makes it disappear. Uh, it's kind of like you put a couple of woodpeckers after it or something like that. It, really? It, it, uh, and it just penetrates it. And not only uh, uh, do you have to worry about it from the heat standpoint, but aerodynamically they're, they're critical to us coming back in for a landing, and uh, you could increase your drag significantly. So rain has always been a factor as the cause of the nature of our thermal protection system. Right. Uh, we do have a qu question from the chat room. Uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Okay. Uh, the first is, uh, did you think this space shuttle will go for another 30 years, or much longer than it did? Uh... Well, uh, back at the beginning of the program, my focus was primarily on getting the shuttle off and proving that we could do what we said it was going to do. I really wasn't focused on the duration of it. Uh, but sitting here today, you know, the shuttle sitting out there on the pad is not the same shuttle that John and I lifted off 30 years ago. The solid rockets have been redesigned. The main Engines have been redesigned several times. The thermal protection system, we have blankets where we used to have some tile, uh, new computers. Uh, all of the, it's got a glass cock now instead of the old instruments that we have. And the folks here at the Kennedy Space Center, they take tender loving care with it. And that show could fly another 30 years if they put their mind to it. Now, speaking of SDS-1, one of my favorite stories, and you, you tell it with such flavor, and I'm sure after 30 years, you've had a chance to polish it a little bit. <laughs> the solid's light, and you guys can actually read, or you find out later on, what your heartbeats are doing. Why don't you tell us a little bit how that whole scenario played out, well, you and John? On the, on the first count, uh, you know, we did scrub. Second count, I thought there was a high probability of scrubbing. And the count only got inside of one minute. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when I turned to John and said, I think we might do it. And uh, that's when my heart rate went up to about 130. Uh, John stayed down at a nice calm 90. He said he wanted us to go faster, but he was too old. Yeah, he, could, uh, he, he wouldn't go any faster. <laughs> and I actually was surprised I didn't go any faster. But uh, that was back at the time where... Uh, um, even though the crew out there now is monitoring, they won't tell you what their heart is. I, I think all the privacy issue with medical things <laughs> have changed all that. I didn't mind mine being public or whatever it was. I was excited, and it was worth the excitement. Now let me ask you a question. You were, there was another surprise that kind of caught you off guard. Those solids gave you a real kick in the pants, didn't they? They did, I, but I, truthfully I expected it. I'm not really sure. It's hard to anticipate exactly what that's going to be like, but being a, a, a Navy pilot, it was right. kind of like a catapult shot coming off an aircraft carrier. 
So it's a nice solid boost. You hope you're headed in the right direction. You, you know you're headed somewhere. Right? <laughs> but it was another surprise. Um, shortly after liftoff, and you roll in to get your head in the right direction, we have a little uh, Kessel Gray tube that shows your trajectory you're supposed to be flying. And we were going well above it. Better than going below it. Right. But we were going well above it. Kessel so, Gray tube. <laughs> yeah. We're, those were chasing <laughs> I'm, I'm beating myself again. But, um, but we had a display that showed okay. what we were supposed to be flying, and we weren't flying it. It turned out the vehicle had more lift than what we anticipated. But uh, and, and that wasn't a problem because on the first stage, you're, what, the guidance is what we call open loop. It's not trying to continually maintain a, a certain uh, position. That, that happens when you get rid of the solid. Uh, yeah, uh, just really quick, any sentimental thoughts on uh, part of STS-1, part of the solids, uh, is on STS-135, so the maiden voyage. Is I wasn't official. even aware of that. Yep, uh, I, believe it's the, uh, uh, I believe it's the left solid, uh, top, that's second good. segment down. That's good. That's uh, good. Uh, and any thoughts on it? Just, is it well, uh, it shows um, on the solids, uh, a lot of people questioned about the reusability of the things. And, uh, <laughs> Made it all the way through? And, and, <laughs> yeah, they can't question. That one. As we said earlier, uh, I ended up uh, being president of the company that built those. And uh, the people out there really do also give those solid rockets a lot of TLC. So, uh, and we'll have, we have two ships out there in the ocean right now that are standing about to recover them when they come back down to know we aren't going to use them again. But uh, the system worked out just like we planned. Well, we've got to let you go because you've got a lot of other places okay. you need to be and a lot thank of people that want to talk. But uh, thank you for being on the okay. air. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.